Good morning. All right, come on, it's a good morning. Good morning. It is great to welcome you to chapel. Um, If you're visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad you're here. We extend a welcome to those who are watching live stream online. This is an exciting morning. We're uh, the second part of our 2016 Thielman Lecture Series. Uh, Calvin Thielman, if you don't know, he was a the pastor of what is now Christ Community Church, while he was also chaplain of Montreat College. He served both communities well and and was a real servant for the kingdom uh, in both of those places. He gave over 30 years of his life to ministry in the Cove, uh, and out of his legacy, uh, out of his commitment to a life with God lived out in the heart and the mind, we continue this lecture series by bringing in um, compelling speakers that uh, challenge us to do the same to live out our kingdom lives in heart, soul, mind, and strength and love of God. And of course, we have a very special guest with us this morning. Before I introduce him, though, I just wanted to make a couple of very quick announcements. Uh, Remember, students, on Friday, we have another chapel uh, with our very own Pastor Jerry Lewis coming to preach. So you do not want to miss that. Uh, That's Friday, chapel. Uh, Also on Saturday, there is another Soul Care Day. It's one of those mini retreats we do at the Black Mountain Campus from 9 to 12. Uh, You got uh, dynamite coffee, light breakfast, uh, just bring a Bible, a journal, and your favorite mug. And what we're going to be talking about is rest. Can I get an amen of somebody who'd like to have some rest? All right. Well, come this Saturday from uh, from uh, 9 to 12. Uh, you do get combo credit for it too, uh, but it's a wonderful time just to sit before the Word to, to really rest in the Lord, so I invite you to, to come and join us for that. Well, it is my very great honor to welcome as our 2016 Thielman Lecture Speaker, Phil Vischer, probably best known as a co-creator of Veggie Tales, or perhaps even better known as Bob the Tomato, um, and uh, he is with us this morning. Uh, he founded Big Idea Productions in 1993. Um, uh, and then in, that started in 1989 when he got into computer animation and wanted to use that to tell stories and to share the uh, stories for children that demonstrate Christian values. And so um, after 2003, when that fell apart, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that, um, he then in 2005 launched Jellyfish Labs, which is sort of his current project, out of which comes a series like What's in the Bible, DVD series, uh, Jelly Telly, and uh, also now he's also doing a weekly uh, Phil Vischer podcast, which has been regularly ranked as on the top 100 most downloaded podcasts, so I invite you to check that out. Uh, he went to St. Paul Bible College, which is now known as Crown College out in, uh, outside of Minneapolis. He's married to his wife, Lisa, has two daughters, Sydney and Shelby, and a son, uh, Jeremy. And uh, interesting fact, and you didn't mention this last night, Phil, that you worked as a truck driver before? It is incorrect. Wow. Really? We need somebody, that's your assignment, is to get on Wikipedia and correct that. Okay. I did uh, some animation for UPS. Ah. And someone misunderstood that as I drove a UPS truck. Animation, truck driving. Yeah. I mean, they're the same thing, really. Fine, I mean, fine line. Well, to bring the truth about who <laughs> Phil Vischer really is, we are very pleased to welcome the one and only Phil Vischer. <laughs> There's a cup holder on the podium. Is that really what that is? That really is a... Wow. American ingenuity is still alive. I was in a megachurch uh, the other day where every seat had a cup holders. It was, I, know, I thought this is the future. Church. No, no, you don't need cup holders. No. Um, hi, kids. I'm Bob the Tomato. <laughs> Or perhaps you know me better as a somewhat uptight British asparagus. Or maybe you'll know me as a cantankerous decorative guard. Ah, uh, there's a really old grape who can't figure out why he's in a vegetable show. Ah, uh, there's Jimmy Gord. Hi, I'm Jimmy Gord. Um, or maybe you know me as a lotion cloud. What a wonderful day we're having today <laughs> at a Montreat Collage, which is not French. No, it's not French. No, Montreat, Montreat. No, okay. 
or uh, the bunny, the bunny, oh, I love the bunny. Uh, or maybe you just know me best as the voice that says, and now it's time for Silly Songs with Laddie, the part of the show <laughs> where Laddie comes out and sings a silly song. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I started Veggie Tales. How many of you were here last night? Anyone? Okay, some, some. Okay, tell the people next to you what they missed so they can be up to speed. Uh, I started, uh, I was a computer animator in Chicago in the late 1980s. I was trying to figure out how to tell stories, like long stories, because all you could do back then with computers was bar graphs and pie charts. You know, and uh, the very high end, Pixar was just starting to make experimental short films that they were showing. There was still, Pixar was still a part of Lucasfilm, still owned by George Lucas, and they were doing little short films that they were showing at conventions, and I was going to those conventions and seeing them and saying, I want to do that, but I have no idea how. Um, and then in the late 1980s, some of the first commercial animation software packages were being introduced and people were starting to think about, could we animate a character? Uh, computer animation in the, in the beginning was for automotive design and medical imaging. That's where it started. In fact, the early conventions were all about those things, industrial design and medical imaging. And I would walk up to people and say, are you doing anything for character animation? And they would say, mm -mm, no. But it was starting to happen in Hollywood. There were people that were starting to write their own code to do things. And I remember I was trying to figure out how am I going to do a complex, you know, a person with arms and legs and hair and clothes and all that stuff. Because that was really, I mean, no one was doing that yet. Um, and then I, I was at a, a, a computer graphics convention and saw a TV commercial that had just been done uh, out on the West Coast, which starred, it was, it was for Sunbeam for a, a toaster oven, and it starred a, a salt and pepper shaker on a yellow tile kitchen countertop. And they, were, they didn't have faces, but they were squishy, and, and computer animation had never been squishy before. It was just rigid. Everything was rigid. And, and, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. How did they do that? So I researched it and figured out they'd written a new piece of code, new piece of software called Lattice Deformation, where you could take, like, you know, this, if this was computer animated, it might have, you know, 10,000 little polygons in it to make it up. If you want to make it bend, in the old days, you would have to animate every one of those polygons changing position. Um, they came up with a technique where you put it in a box and then you animate the points on the box, and whatever was inside the box would then deform to match what you did with the box. And that's how they made these uh, salt pepper shakers dance. And I thought, that's it, that's amazing, okay. But you can't put like a human inside the box, because arms and legs, that wouldn't work. You can only put something like a salt and pepper shaker inside the box. And I thought, well, what kind of characters could I make to put inside the box to make them squish that don't have arms, legs, hair, or clothes? So they need to be naked, bald, and limbless. <laughs> and I'm going to sell them in Christian bookstores. <laughs> I, and I, I was just I'm racking my brain, and the first thing that came to my mind was a candy bar. And I thought, okay, I can make a candy bar, like candy characters, and I can put a face on them, and I can make squishy eyes. And so I developed that technique, and I actually put little lattices around his eyes so that they would squish, just like then a whole lattice over the whole thing, so the whole thing could bend and squish. And I did a little test with the candy bar guy. I thought, this is it. I'm going to make, you know, Bible stories with candy. And then and it'll be a huge hit. Um, and my wife walked by, and she saw the candy bar guy on the computer screen, because I was working at home, and said, you know, moms are going to be mad if you make their kids fall in love with candy bars. And I thought, ooh, she's right. Okay, what wouldn't moms be mad about their kids falling in love with that's shaped like a candy bar? And the next thing that popped into my head was a cucumber. So I threw away the candy bar, I made a cucumber, took the face off the candy bar, put on the cucumber, gave him a big goofy grin, and, uh, and animated a little test. I built a, a yellow tile kitchen countertop, just like the one I'd seen in the, I'm not all that original. Um, <laughs> I didn't invent vegetables either, they pre-existed. Um, and I made the little cucumber guy hop out of a Fiesta Ware bowl on the kitchen countertop and hop up to the camera and then just smile. And then I waited for it to render for like a day and a half to see, you know, if it worked. Because back then you had to do all your animation in, in wireframe. So you were just seeing the lines of the outline of what you were doing. Nothing could move in real time. 
And so it took, you know, a night and a half to render, and then I finally watched it, loaded up all the frames, and, and flipped it, and watched it, and I went, it's alive! He's, and I realized, okay, a kid would believe that character is alive. And that was the key. So I took that, uh, twel- I did a 12-second test called Mr. Cuke's Screen Test. It's 1989, I believe. And uh, then I started going around to Christian publishers. And I'm like, well, you know, who would say no to this? <laughs> it's a smiling cucumber. Um, what says, you know, biblical education more than a smiling cucumber? And uh, Christian publishers said, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. If you can go make the whole show, then bring it back and show it to us, and, you know, we'll see if we can help you distribute it. And I was like, well, I need the money. <laughs> How am I supposed to make the whole show I have the money? Um, and I, no one would give me any money. And I mean, my wife, I just gotten married. We were uh, at a church on the north side of Chicago, and uh, we were meeting in a small group. And one of the couples in our small group is about two years of praying about this with our, our uh, small group members. And one of the couples in the small group finally came to me and said, you know, what you're trying to do is too important for us to let it not happen. Um, and they wrote me a check for $80,000 out of their retirement fund and said, we just want you to start. Uh, and so I quit my job. I bought one, one computer, and the software was $75,000. That's what it cost to animate a pickle in 19... <laughs> It was 1993. That's why there were not animated pickles all over America back then. Um, and so, and I decided I wanted to do it myself. So I set up the computer in our in spare bedroom, started animating. Uh, I wrote the first script, which is Where's God When I'm Scared? The story of Frank and Celery being on TV and scaring Junior and singing God is Bigger Than the Boogeyman, which was the first VeggieTales song ever written before the theme song, before the What Have We Learned song. Uh, my wife was a music major at uh, Wheaton College. I am not a music major. I cannot write complex music to save my life. I, I write music like a third grader would write music. So I wrote that song. I strummed it on my guitar. I can't play the guitar very well, but just well enough to, to write, God is bigger than the boogeyman. And I played it for my music major wife, and her first reaction was, that's too simple to be a real song. And I thought, well, gee... It's about as complex as I can write, so I'm just going to hope that it's complex enough for kids. Turns out kids like simple songs. This is what we learned. Kids, <laughs> simple, think happy birthday. Not a complicated song. Uh, simple songs are sticky songs. So that's uh, where it started. I got about four minutes into animating the first video by myself in my spare bedroom and realized I was going to die a miserable death. Uh, animation, you do not make a half an hour animated film by yourself. Uh, so I uh, hired uh, one kid who had just graduated from University of Illinois in computer graphics, another kid who had just gone to the Art Institute in Chicago in computer graphics, and uh, we rented a storefront on the north side of Chicago, 600 square foot little office space that was in between a Spanish grocery store and a comic book shop. Uh, it was in a two-story building. The whole second floor was apartments where that, that, uh, no one spoke English on the second floor, all Spanish. The landlord only spoke Korean. So <laughs> we, we moved in to move the $75,000 computer and the software into this little office space, uh, put gated bars up on the plate glass windows so the computer would stay there when we left at night. And uh, then the three of us triple shifted around the clock because I could only afford one computer. So we took eight hour shifts and worked around the clock for four months to animate the first video. There was a hole in the ceiling. We didn't notice at first, but uh, there was a hole in the ceiling. We had no idea where it went until one night we were working and uh, something fell through the hole uh, onto the floor next to us while we were animating. And we looked over and it was a half eaten taco. <laughs> And, and my first thought was, it's manna from heaven. <laughs> and my second thought was, wait, God likes Mexican food? 
So it, things got worse, though, when a bucket of water came through the hole <laughs> and landed on my desk, at which point we had, because we didn't speak Spanish and no one upstairs spoke English, but Mike Naraki, who is Larry the Cucumber to my Bob the Tomato, had just started dating a, a Spanish-speaking girl, so we had her write a note saying, no mas agua en la hole, you know, something to that, <laughs> that effect. And, to, and, to, and then we, going up there, realized that the, the hole was actually in their bathroom, and sometimes they would just mop things up and then dump the mop water <laughs> into because they didn't know where it went either. And they just, you know, thought it went to hell or who knows where. And no, it was, it was on my desk. So um, that's what it was like to, to start. We finished the first one uh, for Christmas 1993. I took out ads. At that point, I didn't want to go back to the Christian publishers because I was kind of bitter, you know, which is a fruit of the spirit. Um, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't want their help. They didn't, they didn't offer to help. I don't want their help. I'm going to sell it myself through the mail. I will build the Amway of Christian children's video, and I don't need any of them. So I took out ads in Christian parenting magazines and Christian women's magazines, which used to exist. They've all gone out of business <laughs> since then because magazines no longer exist. Um, <laughs> And we sold about 500 copies, uh, which wasn't even enough to pay for the ads, much less anything else. But uh, among the first people to order them were Christian publishers and Christian music companies who saw the ad and said, oh, look, he made it. <laughs> and uh, uh, sales were not great, but within a couple of weeks, we had offers to fly down to Nashville and meet with some of the big Christian publishers and talk about bringing it into Christian bookstores. So uh, we kept making the next one, and by Christmas of 1994, we had two done, and they both came out in Christian bookstores, where for a year, they did nothing. Uh, as people walked in and said, vegetables telling Bible stories? Let's see what Dobson has. <laughs> So at that point, all of the top 10 selling Christian kids' videos were from Focus on the Family, uh, were either McGee and Me or Adventures in Odyssey or Last Chance Detectives. And no one had wanted to give the time of day to uh, talking vegetables. Except in many of the Christian bookstores, college kids worked. And because they're college kids and they can't be trusted, they couldn't sell things like Bibles. They had to work back in the kids' department. So all these college kids were working in the kids' departments in Christian bookstores where they were now, I mean, the transformative technology that made VeggieTales possible was not the iPod, not the iPhone, it was the VHS deck. That was sweeping America, and for the first time, parents could say, I don't want, to want my kids to watch what's on right now, I want them to watch a show that I choose for them. And you could buy a VHS cassette, and you could put it in this little slot, and suddenly your kids were watching whatever show. This was revolutionary. I know in the age of YouTube, it seems like Pony Express, but it was revolutionary. So uh, college kids, they, 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 the owners had set up VHS players in the backs of all these Christian bookstores, and they were playing the Donut Man or whoever, you know, a guy with the acoustic guitar and a sock puppet singing about Jesus, driving the college kids insane as those tapes looped over and over again. So college kids saw VeggieTales, they took it back to their dorm rooms, they watched it, they got all the Monty Python references and the weird stuff that Mike wrote. Um, <laughs> and started switching out the Donut Man for VeggieTales in the backs of the stores, and parents noticed, and kids noticed, and it started selling. Um, and before we knew it, uh, the top 10 Christian kids' videos were all VeggieTales videos, uh, which was a lot of fun. It was a really fun ride, and that's part of the story I told last night. It's also part of the story that's told in my book, which we actually have some right here. Right. Oh, look, he's holding it up right now. So if you want to hear that whole story, uh, you can pick up the book, because um, it was a lot of fun. And, but you, you have to learn how to do things you've never done before. Like we had, uh, we had Christian bookstores, when it, when it started becoming a hit, we had Christian bookstores calling us saying, hey, can you send, we, we want to have the characters come to our store. You know, can you have Bob and Larry come to our store? And I was like, well, wait, what? They're animated. You know, how do they, no, no, no. And they said, no, 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 Salty the Singing Songbook comes to our store. He's a big, you know, he's, he, they ship him, he's a big book costume, and then one of our volunteers puts him on, and we have kids' days. But, oh, okay, we need costumes. So we go to a costume company, it's Bob and Larry, we need to make them into costumes, I guess. Okay, do they have legs? Well, yeah, they have to have legs, or they can't get around. Okay, well, do they have arms? 
No, no, they don't have arms. No, don't, no arms, no armholes in the costumes. So the first round of, of Bob and Larry costumes, first of all, they were rigid. If you've seen the new ones, the new ones are inflatable. They actually have battery packs and fans, and they inflate themselves, which means, well, which means when Bob's battery runs out, he gets very limp. Uh, <laughs> he just, he's extra squishy now, Mom. Um, but also means you can pack them in a small box and ship them UPS. The first round we made were actually rigid. Larry was about six feet tall. It had to be trucked from one market to another. Very expensive, cost prohibitive. But because he didn't have armholes, if you were inside Larry the Cucumber and you lost your balance, <laughs> you just went down. <laughs> And then other things happened, like uh, Larry the Cucumber was appearing at a store in a mall, and uh, there's a line of kids waiting to meet him, and one of the kids, a kid, little kid in a stroller, brought a hairbrush. He said, Mom, I want to give this hairbrush to Larry the Cucumber. I know, isn't that darling? So he waits and waits and waits, he gets up, he, it's his turn in line, he jumps out of his stroller, he runs up to Larry and says, here Larry, I brought you your hairbrush. So, <laughs> So Larry bends over, I heard about this later, Larry bends over, says, hold the hairbrush down by my leg. <laughs> okay, now that's creepy just to start out with, but... <laughs> so, so the kid, kid goes... <laughs> and a human hand... <laughs> shoots out of the leg hole grabs the hairbrush, and pulls it back in the leg hole. The kid is stunned. He runs back to his mother and says, Mom, Larry just grabbed my hairbrush with his butt. Okay. It's at that point you realize you may have miscalculated. So, you know, but I hadn't done this before. I was, we were all learning as we go. Um, Last night, I talked about dreams. And I talked about, you know, I mean, obviously, Veggie Tales, this was my dream. I wanted to be Walt Disney. I wanted to be the Christian Walt Disney. I wanted to save the world, the world's children from evil. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to build theme parks. I wanted to have, you know, I wanted to do what Walt did. Um, and that uh, ended up falling apart. Because uh, just because you want it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you, A, or from God, B. In this case, it was neither of those. But let's go back to the beginning, because last night I talked about dreams. Today, I want to talk about burdens. Uh, now, that sounds less fun than dreams. You know, we don't, no one talks about, oh boy, do I have a fun burden, you know, or I'm chasing the American burden. No, we don't. You know, a burden is a wish your heart makes. No, we don't. It's, we're not into burdens like we're into dreams, but we're all burdened. Um, I talk a lot to uh, children's ministry workers because of VeggieTales, and then also Christian filmmakers, budding Christian filmmakers because of VeggieTales. And uh, I noticed something when I talk to both those crowds is they look really tired. If you're a children's ministry worker, you teach Sunday school, you're never, you're, they never let you out of the church basement. Um, there's no windows, you're locked in a room full of third grade boys, uh, the only time anyone hears about what you're doing is if something goes horribly wrong. Uh, it is hard doing children's ministry. Uh, if you're a Christian filmmaker, odds are 99% certain you've never actually been allowed to make a film. I mean, a movie. You want to make movies. It is hard to make movies. People don't just hand out millions of dollars to, you know, budding filmmakers. So you've spent, I know people that have spent five years walking a script around trying to make one movie. They look tired. In fact, as I look at these people, I realize they look a lot like I looked uh, in about 1997, 1998. Okay, so VeggieTales, it took a long time to get going, but then when it finally got going, it just really went, you know? I mean, like George Foreman grill, kind of. It just, you know, thigh master. It just, it just <laughs> took off. Um, 1997, uh, the first video where things were really going well and we were actually more money was coming in than we had to spend to make the videos was Madam Blueberry. Uh, we, we just finished, yeah, props to Madam Blueberry. Um, we just finished um, 
Madden Blueberry, we just turned over the master to our, our distributor in Nashville. They were so excited because now it was clear they had a hit on their hands that they sent an executive up to Chicago to take the entire company, uh, eight of us, take the entire company out to lunch to celebrate. And they took us to a nice restaurant in Chicago. The wife of the executive had quilted a VeggieTales quilt for me. Yeah, I think it was related in some way to the size of their Christmas bonuses. But, you know, it was still a nice, it was a nice touch. So, they gave me the quilt, they, we gave them the master, it was a hostage exchange. You know, here's the master, here's the quilt. We had the dinner, everyone was happy, it's like, this is going great. I'm driving home uh, from that dinner and I started to feel chest pain, which I'd never really felt before. Uh, I ignored it because that's what you do, you know, when you're a guy and it's medical. So, I ignored it. <clears throat> I got home, I went to bed that night, and it was getting worse. And by about two in the morning, I could not sleep. It became clear I'm not going to be able to sleep. It feels like someone's sitting on my chest. So I got up and decided I should probably go check into this. So I, I uh, drove myself to the emergency room, uh, didn't, neglected to wake up my wife and tell her, <laughs> any of you that may get married, I would not recommend this. If you're going to go to the emergency room, tell your wife that you're leaving. So I got up, I drove myself to the emergency room, and within about, gee, 30 seconds of, of telling them what my symptoms were, found myself uh, flat on my back on a gurney with nitroglycerin under my tongue in a little alcove under a sign that said critical. And I remember looking up and, and you know, thinking, well, oh, that's funny. <laughs> it, says, it says critical. <laughs> Must be in the wrong alcove. Um, <laughs> And the nurse came by, and I was kind of, you know, like, why, why does that say critical? And she said, because you're critical. And she walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, is this, is this how it ends? <laughs> um, when they finally explained, they, they, they had to wake up a doctor to read my EKG, and they said, okay, no, he's not having a heart attack. Um, do this test, do this test, and, and we'll try to figure out what it is. When they finally figured it out, I said, okay, uh, you have pericarditis. Pericarditis is a viral infection in the lining of your heart. So the, the area around your heart starts to fill up with fluid, which, if you don't do anything about it, will eventually crush your heart, which is bad. Uh, but if they give you heavy antibiotics and you lie in bed for about two weeks, you'll get over it and, and you can recover. It takes a while to get your energy back, so they said, you'll be fine. Um, but I'm, so I'm on a follow-up visit with my wife, you know, and she asked the obvious question, well, how do you get pericarditis? You know, people get sinus infections, they get all sorts of infections, but heart infections, that seems a little severe. Uh, and the doctor looked at me and then looked at her and said, is he under much stress? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next year, I got strep throat. The year after that, I got shingles, uh, which is a you know, viral infection of the nervous system that usually affects the very old or the very frail. Uh, I was 32 at the time. I was working myself to death. I was so stressed and under so much pressure that it was killing me. I finally realized I needed to do something about the stress level and just how I was feeling, so I, I started seeing a Christian counselor to talk it over. And one of the days I met with the counselor happened to be the day of the Columbine shootings in Colorado. And I remember sitting in the parking lot listening to the news report on how many kids had been killed in that shooting right before I walked in for the counseling session. And I walked in and I, I said to the guy, you know, do you, have you heard the latest? Do you know how bad it is? And he said, yeah, yeah, I've heard. And he could see how upset I was, and he finally said, so what, what are you feeling? And I thought about it, and then I said, I could have done something. You know, I could have, I thought, okay, these kids, they were affected by media, by the video games they were playing, by the, the movies they were watching, They're, they were just drowning in this toxic media, and that's what God has called me to do something about. That's what I'm here for. I'm supposed to be doing something about that. Maybe if I had worked harder, maybe if I had started earlier, maybe if I had done more faster, maybe the media wouldn't have been so toxic and maybe this wouldn't have happened. And he looked at me for a while and said, wow, that's quite a burden to carry. 
And they said, yeah, it is. I was carrying an immense burden to save the world, to make a difference, to offset the evil streaming out of Hollywood into living rooms across the country, to do as much as I could, as fast as I could. It was the first thing I thought about in the morning when I woke up and the last thing I thought about before I went to bed at night. And it was making me miserable. It was killing me. I was not a happy person. And then something interesting happened. I was sitting in bed one night reading Paul's letter to the Galatians, where he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. For the first time in my life, it, it occurred to me what Paul meant by that. I mean, I was familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. I think I had to memorize it in Awana for a nickel or something. But I'd always looked at it as an obligation, a duty. If you are a Christian, you have to act loving. You have to act joyful. You have to be kind and patient and self-control. I looked at it like homework. Oh, great, something else I have to do on top of saving the world. But now, for the first time, I saw what Paul really meant. If you are filled with the Spirit, these attributes will flow out of you whether you want them to or not. For an apple tree, producing apples isn't an obligation. It can't be helped. No apple tree accidentally produces grapes and then says, Oh, I'm such an idiot! An apple tree produces apples for the simple fact that it's an apple tree. And the fruit of the Spirit is manifest in the life of someone filled with the Spirit simply because they're filled with the Spirit. It can't be helped. In the same way, uh, oh, I turned to my wife that night, sitting in bed, and said something that startled her. I said, I don't think I'm a Christian. Not what she expected to hear from her creator of VeggieTales husband. I read her the fruit of the Spirit and then said, none of these are coming out of me. I'm not joyful. I have no peace. I'm not filled with love. I'm stressed. I'm cranky. I'm fatigued. I am anxious. And none of those are on the list. Something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what. Now, if you are here last night, you know what happened next. My world fell apart. I lost my business, my characters, my ministry uh, in bankruptcy in 2003. The edifice I had built around me, my means for making a difference, for saving the world, God stood back and let it all fall away. And then he showed me what I had done, how I had made the work I was doing for him more important than my relationship with him. He showed me how miserable I had become, how I had been dragging this burden, this rock uphill that he never intended me to carry, a burden, in fact, that only he could carry. Only one person has ever lived who could actually save the world, and his name wasn't Phil. So I gave up that burden. I let it go. I put down the rock I had heaved for so long, and I rested, and I read the Bible, and I prayed, and I felt God's love for me, a love so strong he was actually willing to let everything I was doing for him fall apart to save me from myself. That freaked me out. The great works I was doing for God weren't as important to him as I was. Wow. Then pretty soon the fruit of the Spirit started to emerge, like daffodils poking through the snow. I felt peace. I felt joy. I felt love. My wife noticed. She liked it. I spent a few months like this after the collapse of my ministry, resting, reading the Bible, feeling God's love for me. I wrote a couple of children's books, one dealing with God's love, but I didn't do much else. I sort of felt like a, a high-powered executive after a nervous breakdown, sitting at home in rehab, shuffling around the house in his bathrobe and his slippers, waving at the neighbors with a goofy grin on his face. Or like a star race car driver in rehab after a big crash, sitting at home with a Fisher-Price plastic steering wheel, pretending to drive. <laughs> and I thought, is this it? Am I done now? Will I just spend the rest of my life writing a few children's books, shuffling around in my slippers? It was great not to feel so burdened, but was this it? 
And then something happened at the park. I'd taken a little office. Uh, I live in Wheaton, Illinois, a college town that looks nothing like this college town. It's flat, but it has a college, so those two things are in common. <laughs> uh, I'd taken a small office in downtown Wheaton, Illinois, just for me, and uh, there was a deli right next to the office, and then a park about a block away. And in the springtime, I would go I'd shuffle down to my office in my bathrobe and my slippers, and I'd shuffle over to the deli, and I'd get a sandwich, and then I'd shuffle down to the park, and I'd sit on a park bench and eat my sandwich. And, and it was spring, and the, and the trees were blooming, and the flowers were blooming, and it was beautiful, and I felt God's love for me, and I was so peaceful. And I was sitting there eating my sandwich on the, on the bench one day, and two little girls ran across in front of me. They were sisters, like three and five years old, and they were running around the bushes, and they were climbing on the benches, and they were running around the fountain, and they were playing, and then I saw their mom coming along with this double stroller, trying to keep up, trying to keep them safe, trying to keep them out of trouble, and my heart went out for her, because I have girls, and I know what the world has set up for little girls. I know that it's just a, a, a couple of years that they go from from Blue's Clues to Jersey Shore, that you go from Gymboree to Abercrombie and Fitch. And just, just in just a couple years, just these sweet little innocent smiles on a five-year-old girl turn into the jaded looks of a junior hire who's been told by the world the only thing that matters is her ability to attract the opposite sex. My heart went out to that mom, and I wanted to help. I thought, okay, how can I, how can I help her? What does she need? And I thought, okay, we're in such a brand-saturated, media-drenched culture. What if I could make a, a media brand that she could trust completely, to, that would help her parent her girls? What if, wouldn't that be great? And then in an instant, I realized, wait a minute, that's what Big Idea was supposed to be. That's why I started this whole thing in the first place. In, in just in an instant, all the, the layoffs and the lawyers and the bankruptcy and the shouting, all that was swept away, and I could see all the way back to the purity of the call I felt when I was in high school to make media that would help a hurting world. I felt a burden for that mom. And this confused me. I, I turned to God and said, okay, you just spent a year getting me to put down that burden. Are you wanting me to pick it up again? I was so confused, I went back to Paul. You know, Paul, the guy talking about peace, joy, and love. He wrote the, the letter of the Philippians, the letter of joy. He said, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. Okay, Paul, what was your life really like? Uh, in his letter, second letter uh, to the Corinthians, he writes, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. And I'd, well, that sounds like my life. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. That sounds miserable. Why wasn't Paul miserable? Why didn't these burdens crush him? How could he be filled with peace, joy, and love in the midst of everything he went through? When he wrote the book of Philippians, he wasn't sitting in a nice hotel. He was in prison. Roman prison. Why wasn't Paul miserable? Now I started looking for clues. I read all of Paul's letters looking for clues. The first clue I found in Colossians, where he says, We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all my energy. And I, yeah, that was me too, and I got pericarditis. Oh, wait a minute, I misread that verse. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Okay, so is Paul saying that he's not dying under this burden because he's not using his own energy, he's using Christ's energy. Okay, how does that work exactly? Uh, in his letter to the Galatians, he writes, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live 
but Christ lives in me. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What Paul seems to be saying is that he's not using his own energy because he's dead. Instead, he is alive through Christ, and it is Christ's energy that is doing all this work and doing all this struggling. Is Paul loony? Does Jesus know anything about this? Let's take it to the big guy himself. Okay, Jesus was looking at a crowd. This is recorded by the gospel writer Mark. Jesus is looking at a crowd, and he says, He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What does it mean to take up your cross and follow Christ? Now, I'm a Westerner. I think I don't know where we're going, but I hope it's someplace fun. If you lived in first century Palestine and someone said to you, Take up your cross and walk this way, you knew exactly where you were going. You were going to die. This is possibly the strangest invitation any public speaker has given to a large crowd. Follow me, we're going to die. Jesus was asking us, if we follow him, to lose our lives. We let go of them. Jesus continues by saying, he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is asking every believer to give up his life. So what is Christ asking us to let go of? Among other things, our goals, our dreams, our ambitions, our burdens. We exchange them. Instead of pursuing our goals, we pursue Christ. Instead of following our hearts, like every Disney movie ever made has told us to do since we were children, we follow Christ's heart. And finally, we exchange our worldly burdens for Christ's burden. Is that a good trade? I mean, we're still burdened, right? Isn't the goal to be completely free of burden? Well, Paul writes about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow in 2 Corinthians when he says, worldly sorrow brings death, but godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Okay, so if you can have worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, can you have a worldly burden and a godly burden? Could there be burdens that come from the world and a burden that comes from Christ? Well, let's check it out. Okay, Matthew talks about Jesus looking out at another crowd of people, people like us, people like the people I speak to that look a little bit stressed, a little bit burdened, living on the edge of burnout. Jesus looks out at this crowd, Matthew 11, and says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Notice that he doesn't say, Come to me, and you will have no burden. He says, come to me and I will put my yoke upon you. I will take your burdens and replace them with mine. The key I was looking for, the key to living the life Paul models for us is accepting Jesus' invitation to lose our lives in him, to let go of worldly burdens and accept Christ's burden. Now, this isn't about how do you find salvation. This isn't about how you get right with God. This is about how do you find the abundant life that Jesus promises. So what's the difference between a worldly burden and a godly burden? This is answering the question, how do we do work for God without becoming so stressed and miserable that no one in their right mind would want what we have? Worldly burdens. Do you have the burden of expectations? You're at college, right? You're supposed to be doing something. Your parents may be paying for this. It's probably not cheap, so you're going to live up to their expectations, right? You're going to live up to your expectations, right? Can you let that go? I grew up in a family of high expectations. I almost said great expectations, but... That's a classic book you don't want to read. Um, <laughs> it's too long. It's boring. Um, no, it's a classic. Go read it right now. 
My great-grandfather was a famous radio preacher. He started a Bible conference in northwest Iowa. He was on the radio every Sunday morning for 40 years. He had missionaries come in and tell about the amazing things they did in far-off lands. They worshipped guys like Billy Graham and Bill Bright, guys that absolutely changed the world for Jesus and sacrificed amazing amounts. And, and there was a part of me, I was a shy kid, I was a quiet kid, I was a middle child, um, I stayed in the basement and played with puppets and computers and Legos. There was a part of me thinking, will I ever do anything big enough to impress my grandparents? What do they expect from me, and can I ever live up to that expectation? What are your expectations for yourself? Can you let them go? Can you take them to the cross and put them down and let them go? What about the burden of outcomes? If people graduate from college and they say, all right, I want to start a company by the time I'm 25. I want to make my first million by the time I'm 30. I want to do this or I want to be married by the time I'm, you know, fill in the blank. Used to be 21, now it's 42, whatever it is. Um, you want a family, you want this, you've got goals, you've got outcomes. Do you have the burden of outcome? Can you let that go? If you are a child of God, if you have given Christ lordship of your life, the outcomes are all up to him, not up to you. He knows where he wants you to end up. You don't have to worry about it. Can you take the outcomes that you've been carrying around, the destinations you envision for yourself, nail them to the cross, and let them go? What about the burden of ego? Anyone? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> I have that burden. After the bankruptcy... Everything was uh, left of Big Idea Productions was sold to a company in New York City, and then they moved it all to Nashville, Tennessee, because that's where all the creative Christians are supposed to live in a tiny commune, writing country songs together. Um, <laughs> so I flew out to New York, and I met with the new owners, and I said, okay, I'll run it for you. You know, I'll be, I, I don't own it anymore, that's okay, but I was the CEO, and I was the chief creative officer, so I'll just keep doing that, and then, you know, you can make your money back. And they they looked at me and said, um, well, actually, we, we spent too much money buying it to let you run it. And I thought, oh, <laughs> ouch, okay. So I went back to Chicago, and, um, and I thought about it. Then I came back, and I said, okay, 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 I'll just be the chief creative officer. Okay, you can run it, you can make all the big decisions, but I'll just, you know, I'll be in charge of all the stories and all the content and all, because I'm the guy, right? I'm the guy. I mean, you need that. And uh, they were quiet for a minute and then said, well, actually, we just gave that position to someone else. And I came back to Chicago, and I got mad. And I thought, oh, really? You think you can do this without me? Well, then I will not raise a finger to help you, and when it all falls apart, don't come crying to me because I warned you. And then I thought, no, I'm trying to follow God. I should probably pray about this. So I spent a day actually fasting and praying about it, and, and my devotions that day happened to be Jeremiah chapter 29, where Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles. The Israelites have been carried away. All their precious things have been packed up and carried away to a pagan land, pagan city. And I thought, wow, that's kind of what just happened to me. All my precious vegetables were packed up and carried away to Nashville. It's not pagan, but it's, you know, weird. So I can, you know... <laughs> And so Jeremiah is writing this letter to say, all right, this is the attitude I want you to take towards this pagan city that you've been carried off to. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. He's going to tell them to stick it to the man and don't cooperate and you know, civil disobedience and don't do, even do the voices for them. And, and, and I start reading and Jeremiah says, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I thought, oh crap. <laughs> you want me to help them. Now, I'm not someone that, like, every time I read a verse, I immediately say, oh, that's God telling me what color socks to wear today, or, you know, oh, I'm not supposed to go to Starbucks. I'm not that guy. But this was like, 
okay, I was fasting about this, I was praying about this, and then this letter just kind of lit up off the page like a divine highlighter came down and highlighted all these verses and then wrote in the margin and said, this was for you, Phil, love God. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I'm supposed to help them. So I went back to New York and I said, okay, what do you guys want me to do? And they said, well, we would like you to uh, read the scripts that, that we're having written and give notes on them. Uh, we won't necessarily take your notes, but we want to see what you think. Uh, and then we'd like you to do voices and write one script a year, just one, one script a year. And I, I said, okay. But I said, um, if you make money off the stuff I've made, like for every dollar you make off the old stuff, could I have like two pennies? And they thought about it, and they went, hmm. I said, Okay. And they made a lot of dollars off the stuff I made, and it added up to a lot of pennies. And everything I did for the next five years, in creating new characters, developing puppets, launching websites, ended up being funded by those pennies off of VeggieTales. And I realized if I had been unwilling to let go of my ego, I would have missed out on God's gift of provision for the next chapter of my ministry. Ego is profoundly powerful as a tool to keep you out of God's will. Can you let it go? Okay, one more. Do you carry any burdens from childhood? No? Good. Okay. <laughs> like I said, I came from a very ambitious ministry family heritage where uh, the, the subliminal message was your value is your impact. I grew up wondering if I was doing enough fast enough. And I also, I, uh, uh, my dad was in advertising, was a really creative guy, and I just, I idolized him. He, had a, he worked for a tire company, laid out ads for a tire company. Hello? Is that him? Am I not supposed to tell this story? Um, <laughs> got it? We good? Okay, good. Uh, he was laying out his ads for his tire company, so I made up my own fictitious tire company when I was like seven, and I would cut pieces out of his ads to make my own. Mine was called Flight Tires. Saves you money. Save. I'd already figured, I was only seven. I'd already figured out this saving money thing seemed to be a big motivator for humans. Um, so I was laying out my own ads. But then came the day, I was nine years old, came the day where he uh, came downstairs with a suitcase in his hand, and he kissed me on the forehead, and then he walked out the door. Uh, and uh, my life split in two, into the half before my dad left and the half after my dad left. And I knew that marriage apparently was not easy. I mean, my parents hadn't been smiling at each other very much anymore, so I knew that there was hard work there. But, but I saw my dad look at that hard work, and then I saw him look at me, and I saw him think, it's not worth it. And some, as a nine-year-old kid, I took that message internally to say, well, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth the hard work. I'm not worth hanging around for. And that message affected me for the next 20 years of my life. It affected my relationships. It affected my marriage. It affected my company. I was afraid anyone that I really, really needed would walk out on me. Um, it affected me in a hundred different ways. Finally, my wife uh, and God had to, had to work on that and get me to a point where I really felt God saying, okay, Phil, what your dad did was really, really hard, but you've been dragging that around for a long, long time. Can you let it go? Can you take that wound, nail it to the cross, and let it go? And I was finally able to do that. What do you carry from childhood? What do you carry from your expectations for yourself or others' expectations for you? What do you carry from your own ego, your own drive to show the world who you are? These are worldly burdens that Christ is calling you to lay down. So what is Christ's burden? What does he ask of you? It's very simple. Obedience. Just follow him. Do what he 
asks. It's not about outcomes. He's not asking you to be the top of your class or to change the world in 12 easy steps. He's, he's just asking you to walk with him. I, I explained last night my new company is called Jellyfish Labs. And the reason it's called Jellyfish is that jellyfish can't locomote. They can't choose their own course. So jellyfish can go squishy, squishy up. It can go squishy, squishy down. But it can't move laterally. So a jellyfish has to stay in the current and trust that the current will carry it where it needs to be. And I realized when I was running Big Idea Productions, I was conceiving of myself like a big studly barracuda. Like, look at me. Look what I can do. I'm going to change the world. You know, thanks, God. Now bless me and stand back. Watch what I can do. Okay, that was when I was 25. Um, I'm not a big stubby barracuda. I'm much closer to a brainless, spineless bag of goo. And I realized that I need to stay in the current of God's will and trust that his will will carry me where he wants me to be. I need to be more like a jellyfish. Christ is calling to you, to all who are weary and burdened. Bring your burdens to the cross and lay them down. Let them go. Then stay there at the cross, resting in God's love. Not his love for the world in abstract, but his very real love for you. I'm back at work, launching new ideas, brainstorming new solutions, serving and ministering with the gifts I've been given. There are still days where I'll start to get stressed over my plans, my schedules, my budgets. Stress will start creeping up my legs like a virus, rem reminding me that while I'm created in the image of God, I still bear the marks of a fallen humanity. But in those moments, I go back to the words of Paul. I go back to the cross. I go back to the purity of my burden for those two little girls and their mom staring down a horribly messy world. I let go of that stress and put my plans and schedules and budgets into God's hands. And once again with Paul can say, rejoice. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Thank you very much. All right. For those of you who have class, please uh, and need to leave now. Please skip it. <laughs> please skip it. You're dismissed. Please leave quietly. For those who are interested in sticking around, we'll have a few minutes of Q&A. later and went longer than I thought. It's fine. Oh well. It's good content. Thank you. Sir, we would see Jesus. Do you know the meaning of the inscription on the podium? I don't. That do faces the speaker? Seems like it's a quote from somebody. Yeah, um, it does. Wondering who. Yeah, so one announcement too. Books will be for sale after this time, right up front here. Right up front. The front books. pew. And as people are walking out, I'll go uh, ahead and yeah. ask one uh, student, kind of from a dean of students perspective yes. that you alluded to recently. Uh, the phrase PDA, public displays of affection, <laughs> you redefined that in college. You want to share that story? Yeah, uh, St. Paul Bible College was having an issue with, with PDA, especially in the professional lobby professional lobby, no PDA of any kind in the professional lobby. Um, I was on the puppet team. Yeah, don't you guys have a puppet team? You should all have a puppet team. And uh, we were given a chapel to do, and so we decided to kind of play on that. So we did a skit in chapel where we turned it into PDA, pup, puppet display of affliction, <laughs> which was about puppets manifesting uh, diseases, uh, coughs, sneezing, uh, measles, in the professional lobby, and, uh, and it was a mystery trying to track down the, the root of the, uh, the puppet display of affliction. <laughs> I, 
I think they liked it. <laughs> it's hard to tell. So for those of you who have questions, feel free to text in your questions on the uh, number up above on the screen, 828-419-0230. We'll try and get through as many of those questions as we can. One question that's come in is, how did you decide what vegetables correlated with which characters? <laughs> uh, well, Bob and Larry were kind of complimentary. Tall, skinny guy, short, fat guy. That's easy. Um, then I was just looking for a variety of shapes. You know, so I remember going, like in the first year I was trying to write stuff, going to a fall festival and seeing all the crazy shapes that gourds come in. You know, that you could basically make any shape and say it's a gourd. And so it, right out of that trip came uh, Jimmy and Jerry Gourd and Mr. Lunt, who were all, you know, not the gourds you eat, but decorative gourds that you can buy, at, you know, at a farm stand. Um, and then we wanted, ultimately, it was, it was hard. We were trying to make female characters that girls would relate to, but so I made a pair and, you know, no five-year-old girl wants to, you know, I want to be like her, <laughs> pair. Um, so then we, we did something. We started a genetic engineering program uh, where we had made the three leaks, the, the wise men, you know, wise men number one, number two, and number three, who still don't have names to this day. Um, but they're just the wise men or the, the scallions. And I thought, okay, well, what if, because they've got kind of hair and they're, you know, slender, what if they had bigger heads? Could we, like, genetically engineer just heads out of green onions? And that led to an a experimental program, ultimately resulting in Esther, because uh, we needed a lead that girls would think was actually pretty. And it's hard to make pretty vegetables <laughs> in general. Pretty vegetables just, you know. So, uh, that, which led to a lot of people saying, what the heck is Esther? And then we would have to write back and say, she's a, a genetically engineered green onion. That's great. So along these lines, what VeggieTales episode do you think had the most impact, not so much with finances and fame, but just the impact on children? Um, I know Madam Blueberry has had a lot of impact on parents when reminded by their children. We've had stories about that, that I was complaining that I didn't have something, and my kids say, remember Madam Blueberry, a thankful heart is a happy heart, Mom. And some moms were pretty mad about that. Um, uh, we've seen a big impact just from, from God is Bigger Than the Boogeyman, you know, the very first episode, especially uh, kids that were sick or dealing, you know, kids in the hospital uh, had some amazing stories come in that just kind of broke my heart about kids dealing with cancer, you know, who, who wanted to watch that video over and over again to be reminded that God is bigger than anything you're facing. So there was something so fundamental about that message uh, that especially, there are a lot of theological messages that are powerful, but not necessarily comprehensible to a three-year-old. <laughs> uh, the notion that God is bigger is comprehensible. You know, that works for a three-year-old. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's tricky as you go on to try to find more messages that are age-appropriate, theologically correct. The easiest way is to just make heresy, you know, woohoo, you could make all sorts of stuff if you don't have to pay attention to the Bible. Uh, but if you actually want to be theologically accurate, orthodox, and age-appropriate, it, it gets kind of tricky. Uh, that's why with what's in the Bible, when I really sat down to teach, you know, the Bible to kids, there wasn't really a goal to target preschoolers, because so much of theology is abstract, you know, sanctification, uh, of redemption, atonement. Those are things that you really, it's hard to explain to a three-year-old, so we set the target more around third grade, you know, m uh, middle elementary school, because they can think abstractly. They are learning things abstract on a daily basis, and that's where you can really get deeper in theology. So one thing I heard you say last night that I think is worth repeating, uh, your mother is a professor of Christian formation, spiritual formation at Wheaton College, She's been a consultant for you with VeggieTales. Yes, um, she keeps me out of trouble. Since the inception. She gave kind of three pillars or principles. Three rules. I said, guides. I was 25 years old. I said, Mom, I want to make Christian videos. Uh, uh, they're going to retell Bible stories, and they're going to be um, vegetables. And she said, okay, uh, rule number one, you will never portray Jesus as a vegetable. And I thought, okay, that's probably a good idea, but there go the Gospels. 
Uh, she said, rule number two, and this gets trickier, do not imply at any time that vegetables can have redemptive relationships with Christ. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> this is going to be hard. If you've seen bad Christian puppet shows where Mr. Lion accepts Jesus into his heart, you know, we're sending some really weird messages to kids about our pets and, and, and our food, if I do it in, in Veggie Tales. So, for example, Bob and Larry never pray on the kitchen countertop, because on the kitchen countertop, they're being Bob and Larry. If they are playing the role of a biblical character, they'll pray, because they're doing what that character did. Uh, when Bob and Larry teach about God, they don't use us and we statements, which would put vegetables and humans together in the same relationship with God. They use you and they statements. So God loves you. God wants to have a relationship with you, not God wants to have a relationship with us, because we're vegetables. So it's, it's little things like that that you probably didn't notice, but they kept us out of you know, the trouble of implying things about vegetables that really aren't helpful to kids. I can't eat that uh, pea. It hasn't been saved. <laughs> so here at Montreat, we like to instruct students on this idea of calling and career and helping students to discern and navigate that, and we think college is a pivotal time for that. Yep. For both college students and others who may be here who are interested in, in pursuing a potential career or hobby interest as an artist, what, what feedback, what advice would you have for, for young artists? For young artists, uh, it has never been easier to make things and get them to an audience. It has never been harder to make a living, doing, especially in the world of film. It is so easy to make films. You can make films with your phone. You can put them on YouTube. A billion people can watch them. Um, they probably won't. You know, a hundred people will probably watch it, and you can't make any money off a hundred people watching your film. Even on, you get like a nickel from YouTube. So, you know, really, what you need to do is is look at the arts. And this is where I get frustrated because because kids will want to go into Christian music, for example. They'll move to Nashville. They'll try to get a record deal. If they can't get a record deal in six months, they give up music. Or they do get a record deal, they put out one record, it does not become a hit. They give up music. Okay, and I'm thinking about all the non-Christians that are dancers and photographers and filmmakers that move to New York City and they wait tables and they work at Starbucks for years because they love the craft. You know, so I, mean, I know people in theater in Chicago that will never make enough to buy a house, but they will do theater in Chicago their whole lives because they feel it's what they're gifted to do. And, and we've bought into this American lie that, you know, if it's what you're supposed to do, it will buy you an upper-class suburban lifestyle. And that's, the, I mean, no one says, I, I'm supposed to be a missionary to Africa, but I'm not sure I'll be able to afford a really nice American-style house in Africa. No one says that, because you don't, you're going to be a missionary. You're not going to live like a suburban American. But if we do missions work here in the arts, we still expect the American lifestyle. Uh, and I, I would love to see more people, you know, honestly willing, oh, but it wouldn't be good for my kids, because then if we're not in the right neighborhood, they won't have good schools and good soccer programs and good ballet. And Okay, well, if you were a missionary, you wouldn't be saying that. You know, if I know people have taken their kids to Africa and their kids have had the most amazing lives. Uh, and take your kids to New York City and live in the city. I know people have moved into Chicago now with their kids, you know, in the inner city. And it's, is it dangerous? Well, more dangerous than the suburbs, yes. But they're loving it, you know. And their kids are actually seeing their parents take risks for God and, and live a life of faith. And, and I think too many of us say, well, I can't take risks for God now. Once my, my kids are out of the house, you know, once I get them into nice colleges and pay for all their orthodontia, then I can take risks for God. Well, what kind of lifestyle have I just modeled for my kids? A lifestyle where you don't take risks for God. So I think we've created generations of Christians that don't take risks because we believe it's in the best interest of our kids. And I think it's actually more in the best interest of our kids to model risk-taking for them. Very good. When it comes to your role as a gifted artist, creator, communicator, 
What do you see your role in relation to the church? Mm. Uh, I see myself as a, as a resource, a resourcer of the church. So, uh, you know, there are churches that are very good at doing a lot of things, but I have, like Liam Neeson, I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> I have a particular set of skills that are very handy. Uh, and they're not as common, so if I can make things you know, that a church can use. That's why, like, what's in the Bible, we've turned the whole series into Sunday school curriculum. So you can take kids through the whole series in a, in a year and cover the whole Bible in a way that's more creative than what the typical church could come up with on their own. You know, so I'm not trying to replace church in any way because the community of church is the fundamental building block of God's kingdom. Um, I'm supplementing you know, I make things that the church can use. Like people that make pews. They're not replacing the church. They're furnishing it. So we've got lots of good questions that have come pews. in. We're going to wrap this up here in a, a couple moments. Um, this talk this morning, you're talking about uh, burdens. Yeah. In, in giving up burdens and in, in trading our burdens. Um, what does that look like for you practically on a on a daily, daily basis, basis, monthly basis. Uh, for me, you know the concept of the canary in the mine shaft. You know they would take canaries into mine shafts because they're really sensitive to methane. And if there's the gas, the, the canary dies. And if the canary dies, get the heck out of the mine shaft. For me, my canary is stress. And I'm all, I'm looking. You know, during the day, when am I feeling stressed? And, and because if I'm stressed, I'm ho typically I'm stressed because I'm holding on to an outcome. You know, I wanted this project to be further along. I wanted this project to be more successful. I, you know, I wanted to be, I didn't want to be here today. I wanted to be here by today. And, what, and when I realized, and there are, there are valid forms of stress, you know, illness, family loss. There are things that like, okay, this is, I really need to, feel something about this. But typically, for me, stress is from holding on to outcomes. And once I say, okay, why am I feeling stressed? And I think about, okay, I'm worried about this plan, this budget, this schedule. Can I let that go? And then I, you know, very, sometimes very literally, just open my hand up and say, okay, God, I'm letting go of that outcome. Uh, this project doesn't have to be done when I want it to be done. In fact, this may not even be the project. You know, and when you can hold things loosely, uh, you just you live without stress. And and when you live without stress, stress is like you know chokeweed for joy. You know, so joy is trying to bloom, and stress will just kill it. And when I can when I can get rid of stress by getting rid of outcomes by worrying about outcomes, the joy comes out, and I find that's actually where my ministry comes from. Ministry comes from the joy, not from the plans. Plans are fine. Sometimes you have to have plans. But joy is what attracts the world to what you're trying to say. So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit of this uh, story you shared um, over dinner about uh, the church you attend and, and this, yeah. this journey that the church has undergone. And then how do you see the church as the hope for the world given both the positives and negatives that oh. church brings with it. Wow. Yeah, there, uh, I, I attend a Christian Missionary Alliance church. We've been in the CMA forever. My great-grandfather was in the CMA. Um, and a heavy missions focus, and there are a lot of ethnic congregations in the CMA. So in our town, I mean, there's a Chinese Alliance church. There's ours, which is a big white, very white Alliance church. And there was a new um, Korean Alliance church that was actually growing very quickly. Our church stalled our pastor, we had a pastor for 32 years, he finally retired, and we had nobody, and we were already starting to kind of lose people as demographics were changing, and so we were not doing well. We had a nice building, and some people, and no pastor, and then there was this new Korean Alliance church that was growing like crazy, had a great Korean pastor, and no building, and so the denomination, the district superintendent, called and said, would you consider merging with the Korean church? And at first everyone thought that idea was kind of crazy, but the more we prayed about it and talked about it, we thought, well, maybe this is something that God wants to show our area 
for how different people can come together in the, in the body of Christ. So uh, six months ago, we did. Uh, a, a largely white Anglo congregation merged with a second generation Asian immigrant congregation with a, a Korean pastor. Um, and it's very interesting. It's going well. Um, and people are really enjoying it. We're discovering, yeah, there are cultural differences. Koreans really love to have early morning prayer meetings. Uh, <laughs> white people, not so much anymore. It actually reminds, because my grandpa loved early morning prayer meetings. And it's like, well, you guys do church like we used to do church when we weren't so lazy. <laughs> you know? You're like not lazy white people doing church. This is it. So we're being really like motivated to, all right, kids, we're going to prayer meeting. <laughs> you know, like, um, I want to watch the voice. So we're, you know, it's it's really good for us. But we want we want people to walk in and say, okay, this is different. This doesn't necessarily make sense. And it would be more comfortable if people just kept to themselves and to their own kind. Um, but that's not what the church is about. The, the church really needs to model for the world people loving each other who have no business being together. Um, you know, you can hang out with atheists that love each other. You know, there are really kind people in every community. It's, it's putting kindness across communities uh, that gets the world's attention. Awesome. Last question. Okay. How can we pray for you? Oh. Um, I, I've discovered that about because of how much media is changing, about every 10 years, I kind of have to throw away all my assumptions and completely reconceive what it is that I do. And I'm actually at that point uh, right now. So I spent, basically, I spent 10 years telling stories through VHS cassettes and then DVDs which is basically just a different form of VHS cassette. That's basically vanished now. The last 10 years, I was, I was on the tail end of DVDs, but also trying to do some things online. Um, and what we discovered is doing things online, it's easy to get an audience. It's hard to get a sustainable income stream. <laughs> so either you're going to do it as a hobby, or you need to, you know, so I'm at the point now of rethinking again. And, and the options are, do I go back to making movies? Because Christian movies are actually working right now, but they tend to be movies of a particular style that not all Christians find appealing. Uh, so we're looking at movies, we're looking at, you know, just, I mean, Tim Keller can write a, an essay and sell it online for $2, Okay. That's the same price that you pay for an episode of Lost that cost $4 million to make on iTunes. And that's the problem that, that filmmakers have right now is, okay, it's I could make more selling just the script <laughs> than I can making it into a short film. So it's really tricky. And then I have kids come up because there's probably 10 different Christian colleges that have full-time film programs now. And so we're graduating you know, a couple hundred little Christian filmmakers every year who have no idea how to do anything that would actually provide them with income. And it's, so it's hard to figure that out. So I'm in the, that's what I need prayer for right now is how are we going to do this going forward? Does it need to go more to a, you know, a, a national public radio or a PBS viewers like you supported model? Um, you know, is it, is it uh, uh, foundations? Does Chick-fil-A need to fund Christian filmmaking, you know, instead of moms buying VHS cassettes? We're trying to figure that out, and it's really tricky. Very good. Well, we want to thank you for, for coming. He's uh, got a question. He's got you a have a question? Really important question. I really don't. Okay. I want to give my positive check. I'm going to be praying for you. <laughs> oh, thank I'm you. I'm going to be in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Very good. Thank you for coming. <laughs> let's, let's give Phil Vischer a round of applause and thank him for coming. Yeah, the, the exciting thing is it is so easy for creative kids to be productive, to make things today. It is so much easier than when I was a kid. But we have to rethink our expectations for what kind of lifestyle will it afford me to make things. 
Uh, you know, there was a day where people lived very simply and they made pottery. You know, they made whatever they wanted. Uh, what's encouraging is that you see people walking away from, by choice from high-paying jobs to go write children's books, to go, you know, to make things with their own hands instead of working in an office and sell them on Etsy, you know, sell them online. So it's encouraging, but I see that less in the church. I actually see it more in the secular world of people willingly lowering their standard of living to use their gifts. And I would love to see that more in the church. And I think we should be inspiring, especially as the economy is shifting, you know, and there are just fewer really, really well-paying jobs for the middle class. I think the church should be leading the effort to say, you know what, you don't have to have that lifestyle to be happy. Because if we are saying you have to have that lifestyle to be happy, we've completely gutted the gospel. You know, and we need to show the world that the gospel means you can be happy, as Paul said, in any circumstance. Even if your, heaven forbid, standard of living was lower than your parents. Which for, for a lot of millennials is reality today. You know, and, and we wring our hands and say, oh, that was not the American dream. Well, who cares about the American dream? Let's talk about the gospel. So anyway, that's what I'm really motivated about right now. So anyway, and we talk about that a lot on my podcast. I do a podcast every week with a friend of mine who's an editor at Christianity Today, uh, Sky Jatani. Uh, so go to iTunes and look up uh, Phil Vischer podcast. And uh, it's, we have a, a local uh, atheist on this week um, talking about whether atheism is a religion or not. And we just have a lot of fun. Awesome. All right. Let me close this with a word of prayer. Okay. And as a reminder, books are available up here, up front. Phil's got a hard stop and needs to be on the road in a few minutes to uh, catch a plane to wherever he's going next. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are God of the universe. We thank you that you do love us, that you've created us in your image. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and the gift of uh, creativity and communication and the stories, the individual stories that all point us to the ultimate story that you have written uh, through the gospel. Thank you for that. Thank you for Phil. We pray for this, uh, this time, this chapter that he's in that comes up every 10 years or so in this discernment process and figuring out uh, how to repackage these amazing stories that your spirit has put upon him and his team and for all Christian artists uh, who are working in, in a similar space. Be with each person here in this room as we go forth today. Help us to... Turn our burdens over to you, Lord, as your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>